And it is the Moon Globe program, and a welcome in on a Sunday night. Our guest tonight is a woman who, uh, I'm told, sings in five languages. I know she's a writer, an artist, a kind of a renaissance woman. Angela Carol Brown, welcome to the program. Thank you. Golly, tell us a little bit about yourself for those who may not know you. You're uh, originally uh, an L.A. lady, right? Yes, I am. I've been in L.A. my entire life. Uh, started singing maybe 20, 25 years ago. When you were 12. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was your family musical? or? Uh, d- well, no one ever pursued it professionally, but yeah, I've got a lot of talent in my family. All of my siblings and I sang in church choirs, and uh, actually so did my father. And uh, we all were made to study instruments, which I always think is a great thing to have kids do. So we've all had some musical experience, but I'm the only one that uh, pursued it professionally. How big a family were you from? I have uh, a brother and sister that I was raised with, Uh and um, a very talented. Actually, my father, uh, not only did he sing as well, but uh, he's a visual artist, a wonderful painter. Uh Oh, so so that's where you get that. talent in the family. That's where you get that part of the talent then, huh? I guess so, yeah. 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 (laughs) Now, very early on, though, you didn't uh, study to be an artist or a singer. You wanted to be an actress, right? I did. I did. I got my degree in theater and did a lot of theater very early on. Uh, right after college, did that for a few years. That was a wonderful experience. That was a lot of fun. I did a lot of classics, did a yeah. lot of Shakespeare. Yeah, George uh, Bernard Shaw, Shakespeare. Yeah. I'm reading this list here, and um, yeah. I mean, you were on the what they say the legitimate stage. I guess so. Yeah, it was really <laughs> a lot of fun. Well, it's nothing like being legit, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when did helps. when did you first start to sing professionally? Um, probably around 1985, I, uh, I was in a, a singing contest uh, out of this pretty legendary cabaret in L.A. that no longer exists called The Rose Tattoo, and I won the contest, and uh, it ended up becoming an annual thing, and it kind of grew from there, and, and from that point on, I just started uh, booking gigs, and I started singing and getting to uh, meet and network with some amazing musicians, and that sort of just began the whole path. Here you are, a thespian, and uh, yeah. I, I can I can visualize it now. Was this on the dare that uh, you entered the contest? or uh, No, 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 not a dare. I just uh, decided I thought I could sing, so <laughs> I thought I'd enter. <laughs> well, chutzpah you have. <laughs> <laughs> in 1984, you uh, you won a prize for your vocal work, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. That was the Stardom Pursuit. It was out of uh, a very legendary old cabaret called the Rose Tattoo. Yeah. That sadly no longer exists. That I I, re- I remember the Rose Tattoo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was wonderful a, memories. It was uh, one of those eclectic kind of places, if I remember yes. right. Very much so. Had about everybody that uh, you could name, and uh, a lot of folks you never heard of. Exactly, and lots of legends came through there as well. Yeah. Lin- Linda Hopkins and Diane Shore, wonderful jazz and blues great. Yeah. Yeah. As we go through the evening, I want to play tracks from uh, your uh, album Slow Club. And oh, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you wrote all the tunes in the album, didn't you? I did. Yeah, well, let, yeah. Let's, let's get the story on each one as we go through them then. Let's, sure. uh, why don't we lead off with Presently Thinking? I, I love the title. And uh, I, I love the song. Where did that idea come from, and what, what is the, the story behind that track? Oddly, uh, I got the title from an ad I saw in a fashion magazine. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't have yeah. been my guess. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God, what a cool little sentence, presently uh, thinking about a kiss. And uh-huh. I the song spun from there. Uh, I see. Well, it's a great <laughs> tune. Thank Here you. is Angela Carol Brown with Presently Thinking. Another one of your compositions that I, I like we're going to get to in a moment, A Kid and Her Dog. You can hardly wait to hear the, the story about that one. Uh, when did you start to, uh, to, to compose? Uh, I started composing probably in the mid to late 80s. Um, after I started getting on the stage and doing things live, I just sort of started getting an itch for um, doing material everyone else wasn't doing. Yeah. Uh, so I started to, to, you know, take my stabs at writing. And, you know, I studied piano for about 12 years as a kid, so I had at least that behind me. I could sit at a piano and I could start to, to compose, and uh, I just started, got the bug. 
Do you have to be in the right place or, you know, in the right mood to write? I'm always in awe of those of you who have that talent. I guess so. You know, in the beginning, it was actually a very difficult task for me. And I remember thinking, how do people do it? How do people do it? Um, but just time and continuing to, to plot along, you know, it, like anything, it just becomes more natural after a while, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, do you find yourself uh, writing personal uh, kind of things that you know uh, reflect your life? Or? I really do, and, I, and in fact, I would say that my songwriting has very much evolved from, you know, in the early days, I think I was writing with the agenda of trying to be hip and trying to be cool and <laughs> trying to impress my musician, you know, fellow musicians, and, and eventually it really started to become very uh, a very personal expression, and I think just maturation makes that happen. You know what I think that is? I think that's maturity. <clears throat> I think I think yeah. growing up does that to you. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think so. <laughs> Another uh, personal expression that you're into is writing poetry. Tell our listeners about that. I do. I write a little bit of poetry, um, and in fact, I uh, have decided to use a, a little bit of that on each of my recordings. So there's a spoken word piece on the Slow Club, and there's a spoken word piece on the the album that my jazz group and I are just about to come out with and so I have managed to find a way to to use some of my poetry in the music as well but yeah I have written a little bit of poetry and had a few pieces published and uh, that, that's, a, that's, that's a hard gig you're not going to make much of a living as a no. poet <laughs> no <laughs> not in this day and age absolutely no. well, not <laughs> sad, sadly I was talking to uh, uh, Mr. Joya the uh, chairman of the uh, uh, National Endowment for the Arts, and he is a poet first and loves poetry. Yeah. But uh, he says, you know, you just, you just can't hardly make a living being a poet. No. no. Kind, of, kind of sad. Is it's writing, writing for music and writing poetry, or the written or spoken word, is that an easy transition for you? Because there really it would seem, anyway, like two kind of diverse uh, approaches. I think having been a poet, made being a songwriter a lot easier. Or, well, maybe not easier, but I think it gave me a deeper connection right. as a songwriter um, because I found that my own instincts were not just about repetitive lines, which a lot of songs have, and, and it, traditional hooks. Instead, I think I, I have taken my songwriting in more unique uh, directions because I had a background in poetry first. Yeah. Now you were awarded, if I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> the Heritage Magazine Award in Poetry as well, right? I was, yeah. This was many years ago, and there was a magazine, a journal, out, uh, a literary journal at the time called Heritage Magazine, and I, I won an award. Wow. Yeah. That has to make you proud. Well, let's play, yeah. that, let's play that track off the album that I, I love the title, and uh, tell us about A Kid and Her Dog. That sounds like it might be a tune about you. Well, no, actually. No? It uh, was inspired by my niece, ah. who was a very, very uh, uh, precocious and outgoing and extraordinary little girl. <laughs> it's yeah. a cute tune. I love it. Thank here you. is Here is Angela with a kid and her dog. Angela Carol Brown is our guest, one of those ladies with three names. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I assume they're all real, really your name. Yes. And not not a stage name or something. I was born with that name. Yes. Right, because you know a lot of people they they're born Twyla Zap and they change their name to <laughs> <laughs> something else. Right. <laughs> now, your work seems to be, as I mentioned earlier, very personal. Uh, is it difficult at times to reach down inside yourself, you know, and pull out something? Uh, that's emotional, something that's close to you. Can that be a difficult task? I suppose it can be a difficult task, and I suppose for many it is. For me, it's liberating. Uh -huh. It's absolutely the only way I could see endeavoring into the, the creative process. I just I don't see any other way to do it except to really reach down and get personal and, and put yourself out there on the line in a very vulnerable way. I think that's what creates great art, and so that's what I'm trying to create. In a very small way, I can really uh, empathize or understand uh, what you're saying because uh, uh, the rest of my day, I own a, an advertising marketing company, and that's what I do. And yeah. uh, uh, I come and do this radio show, and my wife, who's a psychologist, calls it my therapy. 
Yeah. And I think it is, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but as an artist, is there a time that you felt maybe in the past or 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 feared that that you maybe even uncovered too much of yourself? Is that a is that a possibility? Well, it's never been my experience yet, but who knows, who knows about tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of your literary side, you've also written a novel. I have. Tell us about Trading Fours. Uh, Trading Fours is uh, a, a a day in the life of four musicians. So it follows four separate stories that eventually throughout the book intertwine and connect. Uh-huh. And it was really my attempt to write about a section of the music business that I think the average layman doesn't really know anything about. I think the average person out there knows about the celebrities, and they know about the, the, the lounge acts that are parodied on Saturday Night Live, but there's a whole <laughs> world of musicians in between those two yes. that is my life. It's the life I've lived and many live, and I, I think it's an, an interesting life, and I wanted to write about it in a fictional sense, but to give people a sense of, hey, look, these, these musicians exist, and they're, they're wonderful talent out there. They aren't known, uh, but they contribute a lot to culture. Many of them struggle. Is there a struggle in your book or in your in your novel? Yeah, yeah there is. Yeah, yeah. They all have their their own little crosses to bear, uh, from an artistic standpoint and from a career standpoint, and uh, they all have sort of a turning point that they have to make. Now, uh, writing about uh, fictional lives, uh, I would think, and again, I don't know. I've never written a novel. Uh, I would think you'd have to base it in part on real life, on things around you. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, when I was writing for the book, I remember putting the word out to friends and just saying, hey, if you have any anecdotes, any (laughs) fun things or crazy things that have Uh happened to you on Gates, please bring them forward. I'd love to include some things. And, of course, there are inspirations from wonderful musicians that I personally know, or there are certain characters that are amalgams of many different uh, musicians that I know. And so, yes, a lot was drawn from from real life and real experience and, and I, real and, people. And I would think from your own life, too. I mean, you've done uh, yeah. a lot of traveling. You uh, Have you been on yeah. television in Japan? You've done a lot. Uh, yeah. So yeah. there's got to be some of you in that book, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm all over the place. <laughs> <in there. laughs> I'm lurking and haunting in all the corners. <laughs> if, if somebody wants to pick up a copy of Trading Fours, where would they go? Um, the best way to do it is to go to my website, which is AngelaCarolBrown.com. Um, it's also easily findable on Amazon and Borders.com and Barnes and & Noble, but I always tell people the easiest way to do it is just to go to my website. All right, and they can also uh, pick up your albums there, too, I believe. Yes, they can, absolutely. And I think, and it's been a couple of weeks since I visited your website, but uh, isn't some of your artwork on, 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 online as well? I do well? have some. Yes, I do. I yeah. do. You're a painter as well. You mentioned your dad was a, was a yes. visual artist. He's a wonderful painter, yeah. yes. Uh, what kind of, uh, for our listeners, you'll have to paint a word picture here. What kind of uh, art do you do? Uh, I do some portraits, mm-hmm. uh, but I mainly do abstracts, abstract figuratives. I do some collage. Uh, I really do experiment with a lot of different schools of idea. Um, and I'm really just an experimentalist and a hobbyist. I, do, I don't exhibit. I'm not out there in the in the art world, uh, the way in which I have uh, uh, applied it to to my career is I've been uh, doing a lot of graphic design lately, and so I've done the covers of some CDs and some books, and I and I do all of the artwork for my own CDs. Wow! Um, but it's it's mainly just a, a personal self expression. Oh, you're Thank an you. you're an impressive woman, I tell you that. Okay. <laughs> Thank it's you. It's just it's amazing. I mean, everything I I, I mentioned, you do. <laughs> 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 including Sing, and we want to play another track from uh, from your album. Uh, tell us about the uh, track Out of Breath. Out of Breath. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of those songs that was written in a moment of great romantic frustration, let's just put it that way. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that says enough. I think our, our, our <laughs> listeners will get the idea. Here is Angela with whew, Out of Breath. Our guest, Angela, tell us about being, I don't know if our listeners are ready for this, Miss Thing. Oh, goodness gracious. I was (laughs) with uh, a wonderful, eclectic, wacky 
very Zappa-esque uh, orchestra uh-huh. um, for many years called the Orchestra Surreal. And a big orchestra, too, right? Yeah, about 26 pieces, but every so often we would augment it with a few more, depending <laughs> on what size room we were playing. Uh-huh. Um, and it was just a wonderful, uh, very wacky sort of hybrid of classical and pop and rock music um, with lots and lots of... Um, references to a lot of old classical composers and, you know, very much a sort of geek's music um, in sounds, a really cool way. Sounds very, and, uh, very campy. It. I'm sorry? It sounds very campy. Um, it's, it's very high camp, but it's also very high academia. Oh. It really, it, it kind of requires a little bit of some knowledge to really get a lot of the references, you right. know. Right. And um, it was a, a, a brilliant, I think it's a brilliant concept, and it was uh, created uh, by a friend of mine, Ross Wright, uh, who is the, the conductor of this orchestra as the character Elvis Schoenberg, and I <laughs> fronted it as uh, the fabulous Miss Thing. Uh-huh. And I was sort of, a, I used to call myself a cross between uh, RuPaul and Norma Desmond. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that this was, was this was yeah. kind of a genre bending uh, show, I guess. Very right? much so. Very <laughs> much so. Yeah. Well, I, that sounds like fun, and uh, there are a couple of albums out, I guess, still around that uh, came from yeah. that show. Yes, yes, yeah. there are uh, one called Air Surreal and one called It's Alive. <laughs> <laughs> when I first read that Miss Thing, I thought well, she was a, she was in some kind of beauty contest with Volkswagen. But you know, <laughs> then I read yeah. further and I found out it wasn't that. <laughs> On the other hand, you've authored, uh, composed, uh, starred in an off-Broadway show. Tell our listeners about the Purple uh, Sleep Cafe. Yes, I uh, wrote a one-woman show uh, that incorporates some music and is basically about what it is to sort of have an indomitable spirit as an artist to Uh sort of persevere and not give up. And um, it's sort of an odyssey, uh, and I played four or five different characters uh, within the show. And I did it it in L.A. in 1993, Uh and then uh, I resurrected it again for uh, part of a one-act series in New York. So Uh I got a chance to take it off-Broadway in 1994. Yeah. Neat. Now you know you've done you've done uh, off Broadway. You've done uh, campy kind of things uh, oh. with the Miss Thing. You've uh, you've uh, written poetry. You've got a novel out. You're a painter, an artist, and uh, as we're hearing tonight, a wonderful singer. Is there anything you haven't done you want to accomplish? <laughs> <laughs> or have you done uh, it all? More, more of the same. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I tell you what, it's very impressive. It really is. Let's play another track from uh, uh, Slow Club. Tell us about Rest Your Head. Rest Your Head was pr- is probably, of all the pieces on that album, is probably the most personal uh, one. It really, it's a song, I wrote it at a time when I had lost someone. Hmm. And um, it really is a song about regret, about not saying the things that you want to say before someone dies and... Uh, so that one was de- definitely probably the most personal expression on the right, it, It's a very poignant track. Here is Angela okay. with Rest Your Head. <laughs> Angela is our guest, and uh, Angela, of all these tunes on, uh, on, uh, on your album, uh, you've written them all, and I believe the record label is yours. Is that not right? Yeah, I decided to start a little independent label. Um, <laughs> Something else to do. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It was it was getting more and more frustrating trying to get a record deal. And yeah. then when there were ever the possibilities and the teasings of it, it was always about making great compromise, uh, often of integrity. And I just thought, you know, I'd just like to do this on my own, and therefore I don't have to... I don't have to compromise. You don't have to uh, my, answer my vision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I have a wonderful, wonderful uh, jazz trio. Um, if you don't mind my interjecting that, sure. And uh, each of them has uh, projects of their own as well. And so, not only do I want to to have a home, a record label home, for us, but um, I'm hoping to um, to help each of them as individual artists. For example, uh, the drummer on uh, in the Slow Club Quartet, Craig Pilo, just came out with his own solo CD, and he's on the label. So yeah. 
you know, and uh, that it's a wonderful jazz fusion CD, and so called Just Play, and so I'm just trying to, you know, create a home environment for myself and my fellow musicians where they don't have to deal with that behemoth called the record industry. <laughs> while, we're, while we're talking about that, tell uh, tell our listeners about Ed and Jonathan as well. Oh, they're awesome. They're just uh, such, I mean, they've been friends of mine for years, and we all just sort of came together for this project. Ed is one of the most uh, astonishing piano players you'll ever want to hear. Um, and Jonathan also, just a wonderful, um, Jonathan and I have known each other for about 15 years. Um, he's just got a real way about him as a bass player. I would say his strengths are really in the Latin area, and so he brought a lot of that influence to the music. And Craig is amazing, amazing drummer, and he tours all over the world with famous people. So he's a lot of we, we like to tease him and say he's our the celebrity in our in our quartet. Well, you know, but working to wonderful. working yeah. together for a long period of time really is an advantage, especially in jazz, where you have to listen to each other and yes. know where the other player or, or a performer is going. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that the relationship, the musical relationship, is important. You know, because what happens is when you start to play, it really, the whole experience becomes a very collaborative effort. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Now, you're into more music than just jazz. Uh, tell our listeners about some of your other musical projects and albums. I've got, besides the jazz project, the Slow Club Quartet, I also have a folk project called the Global Folk. And it's, it's more of an experimental, electronic, ambient uh, sort of folk experiment, so it isn't your sort of traditional strummed acoustic thing, although there's some of that involved. Uh -huh. um, and I have a wonderful trio involved with that as well, and uh, that's guitar-led. Um, Ken Rosser, Ross Wright, and Paul Angers are that trio. And so between the two, you know, I sort of do my best to, to keep from being a little schizophrenic. It, <laughs> <laughs> it just feeds two sides of me in a, in a very rewarding way. Yeah. You've also yeah. Had, had, the, uh, had the opportunity over the years to perform with some really big names. Uh, I just want to <laughs> name, a, name a couple of them. Keb Moe, one of my favorite oh, blues, yeah. blues guys. I mean, I saw him in yeah. Kansas City just about a year ago. What a, what a performer. He's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I did a recording project with him. Uh, he and I were featured on uh, an, an R&B uh, album called uh, Some Blues, uh -huh. and we, so we were part of a band called Threshold, and that is a wonderful project that I've been the lead singer of for the last couple of years, and that is a project that was created by uh, my guitarist friend Linda Taylor. Uh -huh. She's amazing. And so I got a chance to record with him, uh, Keb Mo for that project. Yeah, and uh, Ricky Martin. Everybody knows Ricky Martin from. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a concert with him. Oh, many many moons ago. Actually, he was already a soap opera star, but he hadn't had the real breakout hit yet. I huh. think that came like the following year. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And and a lady who has been on this program before, and I just think the world of Rita Coolidge. Oh yeah. Isn't she a Isn't she a sweetheart? It's all. She really is. When did you yeah. work? When did you work with Rita? I sang back up with her in goodness. I want to say about 1995 or 96. We did a cruise. Yeah. And um, I was her backup singer for her, and it was a wonderful experience. She's such a down-to-earth lady. Now, cruises, I understand, for performers are really a neat deal. I mean, they feed you. It can you can, be. you can just yeah. relax during the day and perform at night. Exactly. But, but I heard I heard yeah. you say it can be. Did this one turn out not to be, or? No, it was my experience was extraordinary. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> I had a blast. <laughs> one other, one other name, and it just jumped at me uh, from my other life when I used to be into uh, owning radio stations. Uh, I owned a bunch of country music stations, and I worked with this guy a couple of times, and that's Roy Clark. Yeah, but that doesn't seem like something you'd be involved with. I mean, it was a, it was really a fluke. Um, <laughs> I, I, was, <laughs> I was doing a. Um, a golf and tennis, a pro celebrity golf and tennis tournament in uh -huh. Arkansas, Fayetteville, uh -huh. Arkansas. And it actually became an annual thing. It was a fundraiser for cancer research, a really wonderful organization called Phillips Pro Celebrity. And um, every year I would go and I would simply be a backup singer and, an, you know, and a little bit of augmented keyboards yeah. with the house band that played behind all of these celebrities that would perform in the evenings. They'd have the tournaments in the daytime and performances at night. And uh, I, he was one of the, the celebrities on the bill, 
and I got a chance to actually play some some keyboards uh-huh. <laughs> with his band. That was a, a real <laughs> highlight for me because I don't really, I don't do that. <laughs> well, I tell you what, Roy's the, the consummate musician. He may be country, but he's a, he's a real artist. He really is. He, he is really astonishing. Yeah. I, I love him. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. That, that speaking of, uh, of artist and, uh, and uh, music, I want to play the title cut now from your album. Uh, but before we do, there's quite a story that goes with it. If you'd tell our listeners how it all came about. Yeah, The Slow Club, which is the name of the song, uh-huh. is uh, the very first song I ever wrote. And um, at the time I wrote it, I had never, it's a, it's a, the song is about a, a jazz club in Paris. Right. At the time I wrote it, I'd never been to Paris. I'd never, it was a complete invention in my mind. Uh-huh. And um, about two or three years after writing it and performing it around town, I was performing it in a club one night in L.A., and a woman comes up to me with a French accent, and uh-huh. she is very complimentary of the song and proceeds to say, oh, it just takes me back to my days there at the slow club in Paris and my eyes grew wide <laughs> and I went well, well wait a minute this is, song is just made up and she said oh no no there is a slow club in Paris don't tell me that's not what you're singing about wow and so I, I was a little jaw dropped I have to say so I did a little research I looked it up there is a slow club in Paris mm-hmm. and when I finally made it to Paris for the first time maybe 10 years later um I went there, and what was so chilling to me was that all these details that I talk about in my song were in this place. And I thought, you know, I must have lived here. I must have been a chanteuse in another lifetime here in Paris because that was just uh, too coincidental. That's a little spooky. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All these, how, how many years before you made the trip did you write the tune? Um, probably about eight years before. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And you've done a video of this that I, I believe yeah. I believe is on your website, right? Yes, it is. Yes. All right. So I, I urge everybody to, uh, to go to uh, Angela, uh, AngelaCarolBrown.com, right? Yes. And yes. Uh, you can hear the song and you can see the video and uh, you can get spooked with both of us here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's play the tune, though. It's a great tune. Here is Angela with Slow Club. One, two. The best jazz grooves are here on Moonglow with Gaston from FM 89. KMUW Wichita. Angela, uh, you've uh, you've got some ties to Wichita, even KMUW, I believe. I do, I do. My cousin Carla. Yeah. Carla Eccles. Yeah. That's, our, um, our very own KMUW Carla Eccles is yeah. your cousin. My cousin. Yeah. Our uh, her father and my mother were brother and sister. How about that? Yeah. Well, there's just talent of all kinds running through the uh, through the uh, veins of all you folks. Yeah. And uh, yeah. do you get to see Carla very often? Not very often at all. No. But um, but she's a, a joy to, to chat with periodically through email and phone calls. Well, she's probably listening right now. Anything you want to say to your cousin? Hey, baby. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> well, you'll have to come out to Wichita and I see will. Carla and then uh, drop in and say hi to us. I sure will. And in fact, we'd love to have you perform out here someday. That would be great. What uh, What's next for you? Any new projects in the works? Yes, I do. I have two albums coming out, and uh, one of them is with the Flow Club Quartet. Um, we're doing a, a CD called Expressionism. Uh-huh. And uh, we sort of, I like to say that we have uh, devised a kind of sound that is very unique that I like to call um, the Expressionist Jazz Movement. Hmm. Um, and that's because the whole idea of expressionism in art is that it sort of bashes the status quo, as it, as it were, uh-huh. and sort of reinvents. And I, I like to, to think that's kind of how we are approaching music. We are, the next album is almost all covers. There's only one original on there. Um, but what we've done is we decided not to make the, 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 the typical standards CD, which a lot of jazz artists do when they're doing covers, but instead to take songs from different genres 
and to uh, sort of do a fusion of, of experimental ideas and different genres and to bring those songs into a jazz environment. Wow. And so um, I, I think it's a really exciting project. We're going to be covering songs by Jimi Hendrix and Joni Mitchell and Tom Waits and, uh, you know, and yet it's a jazz album. Uh-huh. So um, I think it'll be a really unique and fun thing, and that's, that's going to be called Expressionism. Well, be sure and get, a, get us a copy, and we'll play it here on I the will. radio. All I right. sure will. We've and, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say the other project I'm going to be doing uh, will be a second CD with my folk project as well. Uh-huh. Um, it's actually going to be a duo CD myself and the guitarist, Ken Rosser, and that's going to be called Music for the Weeping Woman. And that'll be a very, very um, sort of intimate kind of uh, rendering, all original music. Well, you're a busy woman, and we appreciate you taking the time to visit with us on the Moongla program well, tonight. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. We, do, we uh, do hope uh, to see you here in Wichita sometime in the near future. Absolutely. Good to talk to you. <laughs> thank you so much, Barry. All right.